the California Supreme Court ruled in 1962 that it was not a crime to be addicted to narcotics, and hippies from around the world flooded into the Golden State. And Anslinger reached retirement age that year, and his final report said that Americans drank 252 million gallons of whiskey in 1962, and that one in five of those jugs were bootleg moonshine, and that each of those gallons of moonshine whiskey had deprived the U.S. government of $10.50 in taxes, which was why 6,000 stills had been destroyed that year by government revenue agents. The Bureau of Narcotics merged with the Food and Drug Administration's Bureau of Drug Abuse Control in 1968 and was renamed the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, BNDD, and given over to the Department of Justice. And the Information Please Almanac Atlas and Yearbook 1974, New York Dan Gollan Paul Associates 1973, said that drug addiction doubled since 1960 with 80,000 addicts in America, while there had been a decline of 50% in Los Angeles, Chicago, St. Louis, and Oakland due to increased, increased policing, while all the other cities had double and triple increases, and Patterson, New Jersey, stood out with a 1,140% increase in the number of heroin addicts. Nixon's war on drugs managed to get America to run out of morphine in 1974, and the Vietnam War ended when Nixon managed to halt the traffic of opium from Turkey, and Nixon's anti-opium policies were so effective that America ran out of codeine for an entire month. Fighting poppies was a fool's game because the medical people needed it and hospitals were struggling to find enough of the drugs so Nixon had to ask other countries to start growing poppies again, which made Turkey angry because they'd cooperated with Nixon in eradicating their own opium crops. We found a girl, or rather the Turkish cops found her and turned her over to us. She's a cured addict. Her name is Mija Gielelis, a Greek Turk girl. She hates those dope-pushing bastards worse than we do. The Turkish cops turned her over to Todd Hunter, and I wangled her from him. I've got her on ice at the station. She's a beautiful kid, too. Smart. There's only one thing. Mousy tended to squeak a little when he got excited. She's practically a dead woman unless we're very careful. The people we're after know she's cured. Know she's a danger to them, too. They'll kill her if they can. Istanbul a Nick Carter Killmaster spy chiller. Page 23. Constantinople considered itself Roman because that was where Constantine had created the first Roman Reich, and Hannibal had committed suicide with the opium he carried in his ring, and Nero had ruled Rome after his mother killed Britannicus with an opium overdose and Latin writers had given directions for making opium, and they said that suffering pain was better than becoming addicted to the stuff. Mr. Booth said that it had been written that the Egyptians ate so much opium that it, quote, numbed them and made them so fickle their word in business could not be trusted. Opium, a History, page 25. Methadone was invented by Germans during Hitler's war, and they called it Adolfophine, Adolfophine, but probably from the Latin doler, meaning pain, and not after Adolf. And methadone was effective for over 30 hours, instead of opium lasting only 8 hours. But it was only a replacement, and the addict would need to be weaned off the methadone. Given a constant dose, Addicts were not spaced out or stoned and were not incapable of work, and Mr. Booth said that at worst they were skinny, impotent, and constipated. One of the four men who founded John Hopkins Hospital had been a junkie and was also shooting cocaine after the war between the states, but he had cured his addiction by switching to morphine, and he would die forty years later still addicted to morphine and happily married and successful. On the 80th anniversary of John Hopkins Hospital in 1969, his secret was revealed in a locked diary left to one of his friends, and most who had known him never suspected he'd been injecting morphine his entire life. 
Opium had been available in America from the Sears catalog, and the man who co-invented Coca-Cola had been a morphine addict, and Mr. Booth said that addic addiction had been an, quote, unavoidable inconvenience, close quote, that was not thought of as a problem, but was at worst a minor unpleasantness, unpleasantness during all those years when opium was legal and overdoses were rare, and addiction was seen as just another natural process of life. On the other hand, addicts in withdrawal, in withdrawal were plagued with hallucinations and nightmares, and small noises and bright lights became painful, feeding the craze about vampires, and they were overwhelmed in feelings of loneliness and took pride in their outcast feelings, and they became demoralized and self-centered and insensitive to the world. The English poem Poet Trackle had been a medic in the Great War and had gone to pharmacy school and he died of an overdose in November of 1914 at the age of 27. And Trackle wrote, The poppy also bloomed silver bore in green capsule our nocturnal star dreams. Close quote, from Dream and Madness, Winter Night, Four Prose Poems by George Trackle, translated by David J. Black, Birmingham, Alabama, Thunder City Press, 1979. What are you raising with silver hand to your eyes, and your eyelids fall as though drunk with poppies, from Transformation of Evil, Winter Night? and shimmering a drop of blood fell into the lonely man's wine and when i drank it it tasted more bitter than poppies and a blackish cloud enveloped my head the crystal tears of damned angels from revelation and fall winter night in America, both the North and the South had grown poppies before the war between the states, but more in the South. And for every soldier who died in battle, five died of disease, primarily because the soldiers had been exposed to only a small viral pool before marching off to war. Soldiers treated medically with opium brought it back home where their families started taking it too and opium made the widows feel better and the wives of the wounded also found it enjoyable. And opium was called a stimulant and the newspapers didn't want to print any bad news about any drugs in 1866 because the drug companies were paying good money for advertising space in the newspapers. The World Exposition of 1876, held in Philadelphia for the 100th anniversary of the American Revolution, showcased the typewriter, the telephone, and the Turkish water pipe, the latter at the Sultan's Pavilion being smoked with what they called Allah's Joy. And for many years, scientists would torture animals in laboratories trying to find a mixture of drugs that would kill pain and not cause addiction. Science continued to fail to remove the veil concealing the opium poppy secret, although people searched and fought and died in the attempt to control its power over themselves, and an addict could physically refrain from taking any more opium, but the remembrance of its embrace would be with them always, and with their spirit, and no cure was ever found, short of stuffing Plato's Neanderthals back into their cave, or perhaps something else left to History Anonymous. A poem by E. E. Cummings said, The bigness of cannon is skillful, but I have seen death's clever enormous voice, which hides in a fragility of poppies. A German-Jewish doctor wrote a book called The Morbid Craving for Morphia in 1878, and even though it was printed in English, everyone ignored it, and addicts continued to buy cures that actually contained more opium, even though the label didn't say so. The Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906 made it law that patent medicines had to be labeled with the real ingredients, and sales fell 50%. Clinics would be opened after the Great War to help addicts regulate the drug, and the clinics also engaged in research on addiction, but were shut down a few years later for promoting vice. 
the National Institute of Mental Health, or NIMH, ran narcotic farms where addicts could gradually withdraw, but most of them went right back to the drug after being released, while rich addicts went to sanitariums where they could be given a steady supply of their medicine. The growing medical industry demanded that opium be controlled so people would stop doctoring themselves, and scientists working for the government in 1951 gave nalorphine to federal prisoners, which was a morphine antagonist, and found that if opiate react receptors were blocked, people became anxious and eventually went full-out psychotic, and nobody ever found out why. Although the experimental drug made addicts go into withdrawal immediately, it made non-addicts go insane, and Dr. Lasagna in Boston gave nalorphine in varying dosage to, dosages to his post-operative patients in 1954 and found that it helped some of them with pain, but they couldn't give it in large enough doses to end the pain without also causing hallucinations and delusions. Alternate versions of history said that Anslinger was fired the year the California Supreme Court ruled that it was not a crime to be addicted to narcotics. And that year, in May of 1962, Anslinger had reached retirement age, and while Vice President Johnson had only been allowed to talk with JFK a few times when JFK was president, nobody was surprised when JFK was shot in Johnson's home state. Anslinger had just turned 70 years old, and he was given a nice job for the next two years laying low in Vienna, working for the UN Drug Commission. Anslinger's Federal Narcotics Bureau had moved into Iran in 1949, and the Shah had banned poppies in 1955, and for the next 13 years Iran was overrun by Turks and Afghans, bringing in opium so the Shah relented and let the Iranians grow poppies again in 1969, but foreigners still brought in twice what Iran could grow, and when the Shah gave the go-ahead, Iran planted 50% more poppies than Turkey. In Iran, there was an opium pipe in every home, and when the U.S. tried to get Iran to drink more alcohol and grow fewer poppies, the Islamists rioted because Muslimism forbade alcohol but allowed opium. In America that year, in 1969, Edward Kennedy was given a two-month suspended sentence for being too drunk to save Mary Jo from drowning. The 60s had started with the election of Edward Kennedy's brother, JFK, and the decade went wild over drugs, beginning with Hollywood spewing itself out through the marvel of television. And America watched as Judy Garland wasted away live on TV for that entire decade. And Judy Garland died in 1969 at the age of 47 that summer, one month before Mary Jo, and that put a cap on the drug-crazed 60s. Nick sat now in the clammy dark cave and stroked the sleek barrel of the savage, and he had another job to raise so much hell, to sow so much devastation that it would be months, perhaps even years, before the syndicate, and now it would seem the Chinese Reds, who were muscling in on a good thing, before they could get operations back to normal. That it was only a stopgap, Nick understood. The opium trade would go on. Somehow the poppies from the small Turkish farms would find their way over the border to the clandestine processing factories. They would be transformed into heroin, which would be pumped into the shrieking veins of addicts all over the world. Men and women, and a lot of kids, teenagers, would die from that heroin, die of infections from filthy, unsterilized needles, die of overdoses, die of police bullets while committing crimes to get money for dope, and those who did not actually die of physical death would still be dead, hopeless. Istanbul, page 96 and 7. The final death knell for the 60s came at Altamont in California in December of 1969 during Mick Jagger's song Sympathy for the Devil when a fight broke out and a young man pulled a gun and was stabbed to death by one of the Hell's Angels. The Grateful Dead had declined to play at the beginning of the Altamont concert because the crowd had been too rowdy 
and the young man who died to put an end to the sixties had been under the influence of methamphetamine, and this horror show had come only six months after Judy Garland's death. At times not a supermarket within a couple miles of Rockingham Drive would extend credit to Judy Garland, and local pharmacies refused to make up her prescriptions because her bills had not been paid for over a year. So she would hoard the prescriptions, and she would try to get by without the pills for a few days. Then she would panic at four in the morning, and some unfortunate friend would be sent to scour the city for an all-night drug store. Rainbow, The Stormy Life of Judy Garland by Christopher Finch, New York, Balanchine Books, Grosset and Dumb Lap, 1975, page 358. Judy had horribly misshapen feet from wearing pointy shoes, and her big toes bent inward at more than a 45-degree angle. And Anslinger didn't think Judy Garland had a problem with narcotics, so they rewarded him with a bit part in a movie in 1948 called To the Ends of the Earth, and they told Anslinger that it might turn into a TV show. Later, Judy told Anslinger that she took amphetamines when she got up in the morning, minor stimulants during the day, a shot of morphine before nighttime engagements, and a sleeping pill before going to bed. Rainbow, page 307 and 8. When she came on the set for the shooting of Get Happy, she was in a somewhat manic state and her breath reeked of peraldehyde, a chemical that is sometimes used as a sedative and also a hypnotic. Peraldehyde gives off a strong, sweet odor. She pointed out a member of the crew, a small, inoffensive man who had been at the studio for years, and began to recite accusations against him under her breath. He's been after my body since I was thirteen years old, was the general drift of her monologue. Eventually, she called the man over and, as soon as he was within range, high kicked him in the teeth. Rainbow, page 275 and 6. Drug use reached from Hollywood to the White House, and JFK had been taking massive painkillers the summer the Soviets built the Berlin Wall in 1961 and his massive testosterone shots were given to alleviate the side effects of the speed he was taking to counteract the swelling from the steroids given for his lack of adrenal hormones and his spinal tuberculosis, and his infirmities were reported to the news media as having come from an old football injury. JFK had a paranoid edge from the drugs when he met with the Russians while Khrushchev had been in a carnival mood and JFK had been getting daily amphetamine injections when he had to face the Bay of Pigs crisis, and Fidel was so disgusted that he made friends with the Russians, who were more than eager to get sugar and tobacco from their new friend Fidel. Left in the dust were thousands of Cubans, with no hope of ever going home to live in Havana in the style to which they'd become accustomed, which had been very nice indeed. And there was no shortage of Cuban exiles who would have shot Kennedy for free, while Khrushchev just wanted to have fun and smoke some really good cigars. The CIA and the FBN were still operating under the assumption that the Russians and the Chinese were planning to take over the world with heroin, and Bobby Kennedy had called a county judge in October of 1960 to suggest that he allow bond for Martin Luther King, who had been, quote, sentenced to four months in prison in Decatur, Georgia, October 25, on the ground that his participation in an Atlanta sit-in demonstration violated the terms of his suspended sentence on a charge of driving without a license, close quote. The World Almanac 1961 and Book of Facts, published annually by the New York World Telegram and The Sun, a Scripps Howard newspaper edited by Harry Hansen in the 66th year of its issue, page 190. Jazz musicians from the South had brought heroin with them to combat the cold when they moved up to Detroit to work in Ford's factories during Hitler's war. And their presence opened up new horizons in class warfare and fresh adventures in racism, and doing drugs with Negroes was as shocking to that generation as had been the society people going to Chinese opium dens the previous century. 
Castro delegation creates uproar. Cuban Premier Fidel Castro, with the bearded aides who accompanied him to the UN General Assembly in New York City and stormed, oh, stormed out of the Hotel Shelburne September 19 and protested to UN Secretary General Dag Hammerskjold that the hotel had made, quote, unacceptable cash demands, close quote. Castro refused a U.N. offer of free accommodations for his delegation elsewhere and went to stay in the Hotel Teresa in the predominantly Negro Harlem district. It was brought out later that the move had been arranged a long time in advance as a propaga propaganda gesture to demonstrate Cuban support for the colored peoples. Book of Facts, page 184. Fuhrer over New Orleans integration. Integration. In the first case of school desegregation below the college level in the Deep South, four Negro girls were escorted into two white elementary schools in New Orleans, November 14, as angry crowds jeered. The next day, most white parents kept their children out of the schools. Violent demonstrations against integration occurred November 16, and scores were arrested. Book of Facts, page 192. In 1960, a book came out telling the story of a white man who put shoe polish on his skin to appear to be an American of African descent, and the popularity of that book fueled the unrest of the 60s. An elderly man, bald and square of build, dressed in worn blue work clothes, peered intently at me. Then he crimped his face as though I were odious and snorted, Pew! His small blue eyes shone with repugnance, a look of such unreasoning contempt for my skin that it filled me with despair. Black Like Me by John Howard Griffin, New York, The New American Library, Houghton, Houghton Mifflin Company, 1960-1961, page 127. Parenthesis, portions of this book first appeared in Sepia Magazine, 1960, close parenthesis. As the Negro Griffin, I walked up the steep hill to the bus station in Montgomery to get the schedule for buses to, to Tuskegee. I received the information from a polite clerk and turned away from the counter. Boy, I heard a woman's voice, harsh and loud. I glanced towards the door to see a large, matriarchal woman, elderly and impatient. Her pinched face grimaced, and she waved me to her. Boy, come here, hurry! Astonished, I obeyed. Get those bags out of the cab, she ordered testily, seeming outraged with my lack of speed. Without thinking, I allowed my face to spread to a grin as though overjoyed to serve her. I carried her bags to the bus and received three haughty dimes. I thanked her profusely. Her eyebrows knitted with irritation, and she finally waved me away. Black Like Me, page 122. I asked about the next bus to Hattiesburg. She answered rudely and glared at me with such loathing I knew I was receiving what the Negroes call the hate stare. It was my first experience with it. It is far more than the look of disapproval one occasionally gets. This was so exaggeratedly hateful I would have been amused if I had not been so surprised. I'd like a one-way ticket to Hattiesburg, please, I said, and placed a ten-dollar bill on the counter. I can't change that big a bill, she said abruptly and turned away as though the matter were closed. I remained at the window feeling strangely abandoned but not knowing what else to do. In a while she flew back at me, her face flushed and fairly shouted, I told you I can't change that big a bill. Surely, I said stiffly, in the entire Greyhound system there must be some means of changing a ten-dollar bill. Perhaps the manager. She jerked the bill furiously from my hand and stepped away from the window. In a moment she reappeared to hurl my change and the ticket on the counter. With such force most of it fell on the floor at my feet. I was truly dumbfounded by this deep fury that possessed her whenever she looked at me. Her performance was so venomous I felt sorry for her. I stooped to pick up my change and ticket from the floor. I wondered how she would feel if she learned that the negro before whom she had behaved in such an unladylike manner was habitually a white man. Black like me, page 52 and 3. 
Once again, a hate stare drew my attention like a magnet. It came from a middle-aged, heavy-set, well-dressed white man. He sat a few yards away, fixing his eyes on me. Nothing can describe the withering horror of this. You feel lost, sick at heart, before such unmasked hatred, not so much because it threatens you as because it shows humans in such an inhuman light. You see a kind of insanity, something so obscene, the very obscenity of it, parenthesis, rather than its threat, close parenthesis, terrifies you. It was so new I could not take my eyes from the man's face. I felt like saying, what in God's name are you doing to yourself, close quote, black like me, page 53. Americans of African descent rioted in every major city when Martin Luther King was assassinated in April of 1968, but Chicago was spared because they were broadcasting a live James Brown concert, and Bobby Kennedy would be dead two months later, but the rioting in the 60s was not confined to America. Bill Haley and his Comets had gone to Germany at the beginning of the 60s and played at the Sports Palace in Berlin, and the audience had rioted and destroyed the place, and the Germans had to quell the riot, and people didn't want to believe that the Germans hadn't changed, so they blamed the East German communists for starting the riot, and the East Germans were supposed to have attempted to show that too much freedom was a bad thing. After Anslinger's FBM was scrapped in 1968 and put under the Department of Justice instead of the Department of the Treasury, Nixon declared his war on drugs in 1971, and Elvis Presley joined in even though he was an addict himself. Elvis had been taking sleeping pills because he was a sleepwalker, and Elvis started taking Dexedrine when his sergeant passed it out to the men and Elvis had slept in the same room with his parents until he joined the army, and Elvis gave some of his dexedrine to Priscilla, but she didn't start in on them right away because she was only 14 years old at the time. Elvis was a surviving twin and had blondish hair, but after being in the army in Germany, he dyed his hair black, and Priscilla dyed hers black too. When Priscilla was 16 years old, Elvis flew her to L.A. where there was a party every night, and they drove to Las Vegas in a bus and spent a week in Las Vegas doing dexedrine and taking sleeping pills. Priscilla spent the next Christmas at Graceland, where Elvis gave her 1,000 milligrams of Placidil, and she slept for a whole day, and Elvis took amphetamines and sleeping pills for several years several years before he graduated to secondals, tuinals, and quaaludes. After a few years of these, he had to take antidepressants, and Elvis had always had an eating disorder and would carry a loaf of bread around with him all day, and he was usually pudgy and thought that taking prescription drugs wasn't the same as taking real drugs. Elvis was invited to the White House, where they asked him to give anti-drug messages through his music to help with the war on drugs, and Nixon gave Elvis a badge, and Elvis always wore a thirty-eight handgun, and he gave Priscilla a small gun to carry, and she thought it was a fashion statement, and all the people around him started wearing guns, too. Being Southerners, they had a live-in maid of African descent, and she had a gun, too, and Elvis hated blue jeans because that was all his family could afford when he was young. Priscilla started taking one pill for every two Elvis took because she was half his size, and one day when they were roughhousing, he blackened her eye and bruised her arm, and she stopped taking drugs after that and developed an ulcer and started having headaches. Someone took a photograph of Elvis laughing as he pretended to strangle her, and Priscilla found out that Elvis had been involved in many affairs with different women, and there began screaming fights with rages from Elvis, who once threw a chair at her that had a stack of albums on it, and one of them hit her in the face and did some damage. Elvis said his mother had often thrown things, and Elvis took Priscilla to the morgue and wandered around showing her dead bodies, and they held hands with the baby's corpse and prayed. 
Priscilla said that Elvis had shown up at the White House wearing a black cape and his face with his face badly swollen and using a cane, and she said that Elvis liked getting the badge from Nixon because he thought it would allow him to travel anywhere carrying his drugs and his gun, especially overseas. And Priscilla said that Nixon gave him the badge against the advice of the FBI because Nixon thought Elvis only wanted to hang it on the wall with his other badges. Priscilla met Chuck Norris in 1973 and started learning Korean karate, and she threw away her false eyelashes and quit wearing jewelry and strange clothes, and she fell in love with one of the karate instructors and obtained a divorce from Elvis in October of 1973 at the Santa Monica Courthouse. By then, the CIA's fight against communism had shifted from trying to make the Golden Triangle safe for capitalism to trying to keep communism out of Afghanistan, where Russia was trying to stop Afghani opium from coming over the border to destroy the motherland. The Afghanis were into corpse mutilation, so the CIA felt sorry enough for the Russians to give the Afghanis only enough Stinger missiles to make the Russians keep their heads down. And to pay for the Stinger missiles, the CIA sold Afghan opium to their mafia friends back in Los Angeles. The CIA thought they could keep the Afghanis on a leash. But the Mujahideen were making their own knives and bullets and guns, and so the Russians would suffer terribly. In the Cold War against communism, the CIA considered drugs the lesser evil and actively gave succor to rebels for whom opium was a currency and who were known opium producers helping to transform the region into a major world heroin source. Opium, a history, page 289 and 90. The CIA got in bed with the Pakistanis, whose military was also growing opium, and the CIA used the Pakistanis to help the Afghanis fight communism, but the political structure of Islam was communism, and the infusion of cash money from America into Pakistan only fueled their Islamic war against India, giving the Pakistanis enough money to buy nuclear bomb capability from someone unknown, and someone else gave India the bomb to keep them safe from the Pakistani Islamic Jihad. Poppy growing shifted from the Golden Triangle, now under anti-opium communist governments, to become concentrated in the extensive poppy fields in Afghanistan along the original Silk Road. And when the merchandise reached the Mediterranean, the opium was loaded onto ships for its journey into Europe, continuing up the Adriatic Sea the length of the Yugoslavian coast, sailing along that same ancient route it always had, right into the lovely Austrian port of Trieste, where the Habsburg Emperor's younger brother had built a castle for his lovely bride in 1856, while Florence Nightingale was passing out opium on the Crimean battlefields, and the British were gearing up for Opium War II. On the 21st of August, in 1858, the new heir to the Austrian throne was born in a castle outside Vienna, and his name was Rudolf, and he was the only son of the Austrian emperor, while none of his three sisters were eligible to ascend to the throne of the officially unofficial Habsburg Holy Roman Empire, because they were female, and the Catholic Church took that very seriously. As heir to the Austrian throne after Franz Joseph, Rudolf was named after the very first Habsburg Holy Roman Emperor, and Rudolf's wife bore him a girl child that left her medically unable to have any more. And when Rudolf was married for seven years, he was given morphine for a chronic cough, after which Rudolf wrote, I cannot get rid of my cough. Sometimes I have frightful attacks which are especially inconvenient at ceremonial occasions. I am keeping the cough under with morphine, although it is an injurious thing. The Fall of the House of Habsburg by Edward Crankshaw, New York, The Viking Press, Popular Library, Eagle Books, 1963, page 240. Rudolph had been giving a great deal of money to a woman named Mizzy, Mizzy Kaspar 
who was supposed to be a prostitute because she would die of syphilis within the decade. And in January of 1889, an 18-year-old girl named Mary Vitsera, who had a Turkish grandmother, was out shopping when she was stopped in the middle of the market and whisked away in a carriage to go visit Rudolph at his hunting lodge in the Vienna woods. And Mary had left the friend she was shopping with behind without saying goodbye, and Mary's shopping companion took their half-empty coach to the police station to report Mary's disappearance. Mary Vitsera was taken to Rudolph's hunting lodge in the Vienna woods where his brother-in-law and a friend had been invited the day before, and Rudolph had come downstairs in his bathrobe with a silk muffler around his royal neck complaining of a cold the day before, and in the morning Rudolph had complained again of a cold but ate a good breakfast with them, and then they had all gone out shooting for a while. That night, Rudolph left the dinner table early after one of his friends had gone back to the palace to tell them that Rudolph wouldn't be showing up for dinner, although the friend hadn't said goodbye to Rudolph. And then the carriage with Mary arrived, and Rudolph sent a telegram to his wife to say he would be staying a second night at the hunting lodge. Mary and Rudolph were served some cold fish and champagne in his bedroom and in the morning they had to break down the door with an axe, because it was one of those old well-built hunting lodge-type doors crafted centuries ago out of solid oak. Rudolph was twenty-nine years old and was dead in his bedroom along with Mary, and their bodies were moved around before the authorities arrived, and various stories emerged about what had happened, but the common theme was that she had died first, hours before Rudolph, because rigor mortis had set in, and then Rudolph had shot himself. One version was that Rudolph had ordered breakfast before shooting himself, but with the conflicting stories in the subsequent cover-up, it could be that it had been Mary who shot him first. Maybe Rudolph shot Mary because he thought she would be bringing him some opium, and when she showed up without it there was hell to pay. His previous source of opium had been the alleged prostitute Mizzy Caspar, but the police had been giving her trouble the month before in December of 1888, and Mary Vetsera had a Turkish grandmother, and she had given Rudolph a personally engraved cigarette case, and Mary had been described as having, quote, deep black eyes, close quote, from the typical dilated pupils of an opium user. A professor of Rudolph's had said that Mary, quote, shared a certain mystic temperament with the Archduke, who could be, quote, the mis most mystical of men, close quote, in that he displayed a, quote, strong vein of superstition, close quote. The Last Days of Archduke Rudolph by Hamill Grant, New York Dodd Mead and Company, 1916, page 111. Rudolph had written that Mary was, quote, a pure atoning angel, close quote, and Rudolph would be allowed a Catholic burial if they claimed he was insane rather than an ordinary suicide. But with the family history of producing dimwits from inbreeding, the insanity plea was not an option, added to the fact that the Pope wouldn't forgive that the girl had been found in his bedroom, naked or not. The Habsburgs had suffered their share of tragedy, and the year before Rudolph's death, his mother's youngest sister, the Duchess of Alanon, had died along with a 113 other people in a fire at a fundraiser in Paris when Lumiere was showing off his new motion picture machine and it had caught on fire. The Duchess had rushed back in to help rescue people, and the only thing left of her were her teeth and a half-melted ring, and Rudolph's mother had gone to a fortune teller the year before and been told that a royal person would die within the year. Rudolph wouldn't have killed himself over a mere love affair because his father had affairs, and his father had been seeing an actress at the time of Rudolph's death, and the mistress wanted to play Ibsen's Nora that year, and everybody tried to stop her, but Franz Joseph allowed it because the state ran the theaters. 
Rudolph's mother would die in 1898 at the hands of an Italian man who had been abandoned by his mother as a baby and had gotten a job as a valet to the Prince of Aragon, and he'd been fired for unknown reasons, and the man had become an anarchist and wanted to kill people in the nobility. When he stabbed Rudolph's mother with a short knife, she was getting on a ferry at Lake Constance that was also called the Schwabian Sea, where Charlemagne had once lived, and then he hanged himself in his jail cell. And Rudolph's mother had died within the hour, and they buried her next to Rudolph, even though she had stated in her will that she wanted to be buried beside the sea. Emperor Franz Joseph had been on the throne for fifty years in 1898, and Rudolf had been his only male heir. And because Franz Joseph's next brother in line, Karl Ludwig, had died of typhoid in 1896 at the age of 62 after visiting the Holy Land, Karl Ludwig's son Franz Ferdinand became the heir to the throne. And Franz Ferdinand was called back to Vienna because with the death of Rudolf, Franz Ferdinand was now the next in line to become the emperor of the Catholic Austrian Empire, which was unofficially still the Holy Roman Empire. The new heir to the throne, Franz Ferdinand, hated Hungarians and called them bad names. And Franz Ferdinand was an unpleasant officer who would punish his soldiers when they didn't deserve it. And Franz Ferdinand had contracted TB from his mother, and the disease made his bad temper worse. Franz Ferdinand had been sent to command the Hungarian troops, but he insisted they speak German instead of their own language called Magyar, and the longer he was in charge, the more his troops hated him. Franz Ferdinand's favorite pastime was shooting, and he had killed a quarter of a million animals before the Great War, including 6,000 stags. And he wanted to be stationed in Budweiss in Bohemia, but he couldn't take the weather in Budweiss because of his TB, and he often needed to lay in the sun all day to rest. The bouts with TB made Franz Ferdinand irritable and bored and very difficult to be around, and people hoped his younger brother Otto would be the next Austrian emperor instead of Franz Ferdinand, but Otto was a flagrant playboy and unlikely to make the grade. Franz Ferdinand had fallen in love with a woman not royal enough for approval from his uncle, the Emperor Franz Joseph. So he'd been allowed to marry her only if it was morganatic, and that meant their children were not allowed to inherit any of his titles, and she was not allowed to be at the dinner table if royalty were visiting, and she wasn't allowed to sit with him at the opera. Franz Ferdinand liked Russians because they'd sent a couple hundred thousand soldiers into Austria to help put down the Hungarian riots in the year of revolutions in 1848, and Franz Ferdinand really liked the Kaiser, who was four years older than him, and the Kaiser was especially nice to Franz Ferdinand's wife, but most importantly, the Kaiser knew that Franz Ferdinand was fully behind the Kaiser's idea of building the railroad to Turkey. In 1892, Franz Ferdinand had gone on a long sea voyage to improve his TB, and he went to India and to Japan and to Australia and to America. And then Franz Ferdinand went up the Nile with his brother Otto to party all night in Cairo, while his relatives went on a tour of the Holy Land. And then Franz Ferdinand and Otto went to Monte Carlo, and then they ran around Spain for a while. And Franz Joseph thought that Franz Ferdinand was a bad influence on Rudolf. With the assassination of Franz Ferdinand and his wife in the summer of 1914, the great war that followed would do much more than simply knock the Austrian and German nobility off their thrones. But the general understanding of the spiritual order of the world was upended, since no nobility were supposed to have been divinely created and appointed by God and watched over by his angels. Notwithstanding the murder of the heir to the Catholic Holy Roman Empire, the incredible destruction of the Great War challenged the most stalwart of the faithful, and people began to search for new ways to approach the deity, with ordinary people beginning to have seances and t 
table-tapping parties rather than sitting in churches, because God was now obviously dead, killed off somewhere in the trenches, and it had not been the first time in history that people had distanced themselves from God. Americans in the New World had learned self-reliance being so far away from Europe, and in America the New Landers were reading Emerson's book about the natural man in 1836 and studying the science of nature that was all the rage, because it was opposed to the notion that God had chosen to elevate kings and queens over the common natural man. And in the New World in America, the importance of the individual was being trumpeted over the status of the nobility. Theories of, quote, humanism, with its belief in a common noble nature, was opposed to there being a divinely decreed class of nobles by birth. And humanists said that punishment was not necessary, and that materialism was for the common good, and that people had utilitarian usefulness, and were deserving of equality and justice. The humanists created the concept of quote-unquote public opinion, with newspaper writers and journalists acting as their guides, who were working out of a duty to the common man, rather than for any personal gain and Adam Smith wrote books about free trade and free play of natural laws, and he wrote about the science of peaceful production before Marx ever started putting words on paper. The English poets had made nature sound romantic, which is why it was called the Romantic Age, and Samuel Taylor Coleridge was a romantic dreamer who was eating lots of opium and writing poems. And S.T.C. enjoyed reading Tom Paine, and one of his friends kept a lock of George Washington's hair in a box. S.T.C. thought the French Revolution was marvelous, but that it had gone too far, and S.T.C. and his opium-eating friends wanted to bring about the golden age of man, and they also smoked hashish which they called nepenthe, after the stuff described in Homer's writing. S.T.C. and his friends wanted to go to America and get close to nature after reading about buffaloes and friendly Indians. And then they decided that the stories about America were just a real estate scheme because they didn't have the skills or the money to make it in the New World. Instead, S.T.C. practiced chopping wood for his fireplace and hauling water from an outdoor pump, and the romantic notion of living close to nature wore him down, and S.T.C. ate more and more opium, and everyone grew tired of lending S.T.C. money. S.T.C. was living off a trust fund from his wealthy patrons, the Wedgwoods, whose son was also an opium addict and S.T.C. was drinking a pint of laudanum a day, and when he'd used up most of his money, the Wedgwood, Wedgwoods cut his trust fund in half. S.T.C. moved to Oxford Street in Kingsdon, where he lived with his opium-addicted friend Tom Wedgwood, who helped S.T.C. publish a weekly political paper called The Watchman. But their newspaper made no money because the reading public was too busy worrying about Napoleon to care about any of their romantic dreams. The last copy was printed in May of 1796, and the maid used the stacks of his unsold newspapers to keep the fire going. S.T.C. wanted to go to Germany to meet Schiller, and he wanted to earn money translating Schiller into English but instead he became a tutor for the children of a rich lady, and the job lasted five weeks, after which S.T.C. left for Germany with his friend William Wordsworth. When S.T.C. came back from Germany, he started drinking large amounts of brandy with his laudanum, and he continued fighting with anyone wanting to come between him and his opium. Three years later, Tom Wedgwood was dead at the age of thirty-four, and S.T.C. got on a ship to Malta, where he tried to kick his habit, but it didn't work. And when S.T.C. got back to England, he told everyone that most of the writing he'd done in Italy had gotten lost when Napoleon's army marched through, and none of it has ever been found. 
Napoleon was defeated, but STC continued to eat opium, and he died in July of 1834 at the age of 61, while the British were getting ready to go to war with China in the First Opium War so Britain could keep selling opium to the Chinese. STC had written Kublai Khan, A Vision in a Dream, that began, In Xanadu did Kublai Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, and people began to think that addiction was pretty romantic with all these writers harping on the same theme. And Wordsworth had tried to help his friends with their opium problem, especially wanting to help Thomas de Quincey, but they would sneak out in the middle of the night to go find more of the, their drug. De Quincey had published Confessions of an English Opium Eater in 1822, and he did a revised version in 1856 after Wordsworth died, but it wasn't as racy as the first edi edition, and it was twice as long. And after De Quincey had written his Confessions of an English Opium Eater, his romanticized version of being addicted to opium made the drug popular with the intelligentsia and the leisure class. De Quincey had studied German philosophy, and he owned 5,000 books, and he'd begun use, probably begun using opium with a lady prostitute friend, since prostitutes took opium to ease the pain of venereal diseases, and they also used it to rob their customers. De Quincey didn't mention that aspect in his book because he didn't want people to link opium with prostitution, but instead he would sit in his library with a quart of ruby-colored laudanum while reading German metaphysics, indulging in an entire world away from the streets and alleys of the lower classes, and he wrote that eating opium took hours to take effect, but drinking laudanum worked immediately. De Quincey would take a dose before he went to the opera, and the dosage he was taking in a pint of laudanum was three grams of opium, and De Quincey spent the rest of his life trying to cut down on that amount. De Quincey was afraid of what was called spontaneous combustion, and he insisted that people who drank too much alcohol could light a pipe and explode and the Romantic Age had come to an end with the death of Sir Walter Scott in 1832, but de Quincey had missed that, and he wrote that the reason he used so much opium was that teaspoons had become larger because only women drank tea before Napoleon, and women used smaller spoons, so in de Quincey's reasoning, a measure of opium was supposed to be the larger teaspoon. As the most popular romantic writer, Sir Walter Scott wrote stories about brave heroes adventuring into the untamed wilderness, and Thomas Jefferson had wanted Lewis and Clark to give copies of Robinson Crusoe to the American Indians, who were being described romantically as, quote, the noble savage, close quote, and many books were written in England along these lines, describing nature in America as idyllic and peaceful. <clears throat> The English had long experience dealing with aboriginals in foreign lands, but the Indians they ruled were mostly in tropical climates, and American Indians did not buckle down like these others. And when some Indians from America were invited over to visit the British Queen, the English found out that the American noble savage was a cannibal and a slaver and a torturer just like the rest. There was confusion in England over the word Indian, because the English could not believe that atrocities had been committed by their beloved and peaceful India Indians, their colony of choice. And in America, all the Indians had liked Lewis and Clark along what is now U.S. Highway 12, running beside the Clearwater River in Idaho. But when Lewis and Clark saw starvation and warfare among the Indians, their foremost promise was to help them become civilized and equal Americans. The West had once been considered the land between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River. But after 1840, the real West opened up that would bring the American dream to life. People wanted to get away from civilization and were enchanted with the Wild West, and from 1790 to 1840, the population of America grew fourfold after, getting, after having rid themselves of King, George Red, King George's Redcoats. 
and the American army was now tasked with bringing law and order to Indian country, but first they needed maps. Some pioneers went west seeking religious freedom, especially the Mormon church that had been born in 1830, and Joseph Smith would be murdered by a mob in St. Louis in 1844, and other religious Americans had disliked Joseph Smith because he talked too much about magic, crystal, magic crystals and myths from German fairy tales. Brigham Young assumed leadership of the Mormon flock, and Brigham Young was a very good-looking young man, and he decided to move west after reading Fremont's description of the Great Salt Lake, and as they undertook the journey to the west, Orson Pratt, quote, took celestial observations, close quote, to measure their progress, and the Mormons planted sunflowers to mark the trail. Within sight of their promised land, many Mormons, including Brigham Young, became so sick that Orson Pratt was sent ahead with an advance party to start their first planting of potatoes, and they would also plant alfalfa, the sacred grain of ancient Rome. Pratt went down Reed's Cut-Off, a trail made through the forest by the Donner Party the previous year and Pratt and Snow were the first to get to the Great Salt Lake in July of 1847, where they planted five acres of potatoes, and the others arrived within the week to plant more food. On September 11, 1857, a wagon train the size of the original Mormon group came through on their way to California, and they asked if the Mormons were willing to sell some food, and the wagon train was massacred by Indians, and that would lead to a formal trial that would take twenty years, and Mormons, who had been accused of inciting the Indians to murder the wagon train, were taken back to the same spot and shot. Remains of Mormon Massacre Victims Unearthed A.P. Salt Lake City the bones of ten men, women, and children believed to have been among 120 California-bound pioneers massacred by a Mormon militia and Indian allies in 1857 have been unexpectedly unearthed. All evidence substantiates that they were victims of the Mountain Meadows Massacre. The Arkansas emigrants were tricked into laying down their arms with a promise of safe passage and slain for reasons still not fully understood. It was a time when Utah Mormons feared an invasion by the U.S. Army and recalled their persecution by Gentiles in Arkansas. Page A5, Seattle P.I., Saturday, August 14, 1999. It wasn't simply people hoping for a better life that were moving west, though there were many of those, but thousands of rich folks went west looking for adventure. And the rich were good at getting into trouble, and because most of them had friends in Congress back home, the U.S. began building forts to keep the well-to-do people safe from Indians. Congress had passed a law in 1820 that any American could buy a farm from the government for $100 instead of the old price selling a whole section for 640 and that made the factory owners in New England mad because many of their workers quit their jobs to head out west. And the new farm law made the South mad because the government was spending southern taxes on western roads. The South wanted each state to pay for their own roads, but the great Wild West was divided only into territories that had not yet gained statehood, and the Americans moving west were in need of military protection, which was quite expensive. More tax money had to be raised to pay for soldiers to fight the Indians. While the Navy had been consuming its fair share of the budget, the South wanted each state to pay for their own roads, but the Great Wild West was divided only into territories that had not yet gained statehoods, and as Americans moving west were in need of military protection, which was quite expensive, more tax money had to be raised to pay for soldiers to fight the Indians. While the Navy had been consuming its fair share of the budget, Jefferson had created his Army Corps of Engineering and the 
academy at West Point to train officers who could lead civilian militias, and he did not int intend for the military to be kept separate from civilians because Jefferson had seen the British Army use professional soldiers, and that had not worked out well for them. The Lewis and Clark expedition was undertaken not as a conquest for empire, but for the advancement of science with expansion into the Wild West, and the journey was also used as military training for young officers, such as John Charles Fremont, who went in search of trails west, and he considered it to be a scientific survey rather than a police action. A popular myth had caught Fremont's imagination about a magical Buenaventura River running under the Rocky Mountains that would allow people to sail from New England to the Pacific and then on to China, and everybody was searching for a shorter route to China. In Spanish, Buenaventura meant good fortune, and Fremont spent more than his share of time looking for it. John Charles Fremont hiked farther than Lewis and Clark, and some called him the Pathfinder. Others called him the path marker. Some people called him, quote, the followers of the follower of other men's trails, close quote. Others knew him as, quote, hero of a romantic elopement with Senator Benton's sparkling daughter, Jessie, close quote. A history of presidential elections by Eugene H. Roseboom, New York, the Macmillan Company, 1957, page 162. Thomas Hart Benton believed in the manifest destiny of America. And his daughter was of Scottish descent, and Fremont was of French descent. And Jesse's father was a rich and important man. So Jesse was very well educated, thanks to the love of her father. When Jesse fell in love with Fremont, Benton allowed them to live in his house. But even though he was not over-fond of Fremont, but being a politician, Benton was able to bend a little. Fremont was welcomed into the family home in St. Louis, but no Protestant minister would marry Jessie and her beloved Fremont until a Catholic priest agreed to make the marriage official after they had eloped. The man who would become the next American president wanted to marry Jessie first, but she wanted Fremont instead, and President Polk would die childless in his home state of Tennessee ninety days after leaving office at the age of fifty-three in March of 1849. Benton would serve as the senator from Missouri for thirty years, and he was in charge of giving out government contracts for exploring the new western territories specifically to map makers and Benton made sure Fremont got more than his share of funds for his adventures, and that money would be well spent. Fremont would be gone for five of the eight years after marrying Jesse, while she stayed home to write stories about him, and even though most people couldn't read, Jesse's stories about Fremont's thrilling adventures in the West were read aloud, and that made them sound even more fantastical. People had also been learning about California through gossip and tall tales, and Jessie was only twenty years old when she began writing the tales Fremont dictated to her, and as a young girl in love, she made her husband's journey sound not just important but very romantic, and these stories became official government documents published by Congress. Fremont's descriptions made California sound like a garden, and the reports published as U.S. Senate documents were printed with hundreds and hundreds of copies. And as Fremont signed his name to Jesse's words, these papers were also considered scientific reports, and people who read them were enchanted because America was hungry for entertainment at the time. The land around St. Louis had first been claimed for France by a Frenchman named La Salle in 1682, and he named it after his King Louis. And before him a French priest and a trapper had made friends with the Indians around St. Louis in 1673, and after them French priests built a mission in St. Louis in 1700, and then miners showed up to dig lead out of the ground to make bullets. Some Spanish had been living up the Mississippi since 1541, but a French trapper built the first trading post in 1763 at St. Louis, 
And the French government had let only Catholics come to America, so France didn't get as many American settlers as they might have. Spain claimed Missouri in 1762, and France took it back in 1800. Until the U.S. bought Missouri from France three years later in 1803, and Lewis and Clark were sent out to explore the new land that now belonged to America, after which Lewis was made the governor of Missouri. Earthquakes along the New Madrid Fault shook everyone up when Missouri became a territory in 1812, and the earthquakes were felt 1,000 miles away. And Missouri mostly wanted to be a slave state, while the man spearheading the Missouri Compromise in 1820 would say, I would rather be right than be president. There were eleven free states in the north, and eleven with slavery in the south. So Missouri became the crucial battleground in having a balance between slave and free. The slave trade was made punishable by death in 1820, and people were supposed to have only the slaves they owned as breeding stock, and they were not supposed to buy any more, but juries in the South would not, up, not uphold the law, and Missouri became a slave state in 1821 because Maine was admitted free, and that kept the score 12 to 12. <laughs> 